boy, do I have a treat for you today. We have an extraordinary playbook. Amishi Ja, she's the professor at the U of M. I usually have the University of Miami people about football, but more importantly, this excites me, just shows you how my life has transformed. Amishi, we're gonna, she's the director of contemplative neuroscience for the Mindfulness Research and Practice Initiative, and more importantly, author of Peak Mind, which believe it or not, is my pursuit. Um, so I believe in two constructs. I believe in the man-made construct of time based on the speed of light. And I think in order to understand mindfulness, we have to understand where we live, which is in the space where 186,000 miles per second exists. But in order to understand mindfulness, attention, resilience, all the things that you write about in peak mind, we have to understand that the th speed of thought moves so much faster than 186,000 miles per second. And how do we reconcile all of these thoughts that we have that are moving so much faster than we're capable of moving? For you, as someone who actually knows what they're talking about, not the ignorant, humble person I am who is in an exploration of a peak mind of being at my highest self, my highest potential, how do you relate time with mindfulness? Oh, such a great question right off the bat. <laughs> So it's so central to mindfulness because as I'm a, I'm a researcher of attention and one of the things that we know that's an incredible capability of the human mind is to time travel. So we can take our attention and we can rewind it so that we're now paying attention to past memories or we can fast forward it to what's happening next. And most of the time this is super beneficial for us, for our ability to reflect on the past and learn from, from it or productively plan but under some circumstances, in moments of, at least my war college colleagues will call it VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Those kinds of circumstances, now you're not just productively time traveling, you're actually unproductively probably getting stuck in the past or the future. And this has costs for our attention. And actually it's the exact reason that I came upon mindfulness and incorporated it into my lab's research. It's not something I ever, I don't consider myself really a mindfulness researcher, but out of all the different kinds of solutions that we tried, it's the one that worked. And so to really answer your question, the reason I think it's so helpful is because we need to be able to on command, on demand, get our attention to be in the present moment. But our default is to time travel away. So mindfulness and mindfulness practices in particular train the mind to be able to pay attention to the present moment. That's how I think it's related to time. And speaking of the present moment, is it true that the mind can only pay attention to one thing at a time? It can only focus in on one thing at a time? Things that are attentionally demanding, yes. So if you already know how to walk, yes, you can walk and talk. But if I put you on the edge of a cliff and I ask you to walk and talk, you probably can't do both very well at once. And does that make the skill or muscle or whatever they call the neuromuscularity of being able to refocus. Because as you say, we wander through time and mindfulness that those that are capable of gathering data from multiple data points and refocusing back to a centralized data point would appear in the speed of light or in man-made constructive time as multitasking, but actually they would be just utilizing a capability of gathering enough data from multiple data sets in order to uh, be able to, to coalesce or to understand what they're doing, but yet still be able to utilize, for example, I'm speaking to you, but I can gather data on five different people while I'm speaking to you at the same time and process it and be able to do my email, check a text, do an interview all at the same time. And I practice that muscle or whatever you call it within the neuroplasticity of my mind. Well, so here's the thing, right? That most of us would say, you're multitasking. You're doing multiple things at once. But the reality is you're not. I'm not saying that you can't be good at it, but what you're actually doing is task switching, right? right. So you're investing, disengaging, moving, reinvesting. And you can get better and better at doing that. But it's, it's actually a very intentionally costly thing to do. You might be driving down. In fact, our research suggests you are driving down your core attentional fuel uh, by putting yourself in a position where you need to do that, engaging, disengaging, and moving. And yet, just like a marathon runner, if, you know, I come from the athletic background, mm -hmm. that if you were in such supreme condition, 
that it would be beneficial comparatively that someone could say, well, if you're doing this exercise, this exercise, and this exercise, you're going to diminish or deplete the amount of energy you have or ATP that you have. But there's some athletes that are so extraordinary fit in practice that they actually can achieve that in the practical world of a race. It may be beneficial. Can you see where it may, even though it depletes you, and I see that, that it could be in a productivity, accessibility, and gratitude sense, something that could be beneficial to your daily practices? And you're not going to be able to convince me that multitasking is a thing that people should do. I'll just okay. tell you that. Good, good. Well, and, that's our one opinion. But it doesn't mean that you aren't a super tasker. And there are some people that are exceptional at being able to do the shifting function. But there's another way that I think you can achieve a lot of what you're talking about that doesn't require us to invest and de-invest sort of in a repetitive and uh, sequential manner. So every single coaching client of mine, listen in, because this just shows you that I'm full of shit. <laughs> And you're paying me for nothing. I brought the expert in here. So please help everybody. <laughs> no, I think you're probably doing it in a way that maybe more a lot. It might feel like you're multitasking. But I think you're probably doing this other thing, especially knowing that you're, you're vel- well-versed in uh, meditation practices. So the other way that we make our attention is not about narrowing, focusing, and limiting, right? That's really what we mean when we say focus. It's we're privileging some information at the expense of other information. High signal to noise ratio would be another way to say it. But another way we can pay attention is a broad and receptive approach, something I call like the floodlight of attention. So that, going back to your earlier point regarding time, is about being receptive and not selecting anything out in the present moment. It's about paying attention to the now, And when you pay attention to the now, it does offer you more data about what's occurring. So I think that you might be able to achieve everything that you're talking about, get data in regarding multiple people, et cetera, but you're probably not studying each individual person individually and then disengaging and going to the next one. You're probably getting a more gestalt, sort of broad, receptive orientation. And then you can go in and use the flashlight to probe in on one person. So... I would say probably that's a, a a better energetic approach and probably what you might already be doing. I love that. Um, and thank you, because I'm going to try to redefine or analyze how and what I do with a different methodology in mind. When we talk about attention, though, you know, I, this now is so important to me. I talk about you need to know your what, your who, and your how in order to facilitate the importance priority or prioritization that occurs in order to create an activity. Most people sit in procrastination or what they call laziness or stuck because they can't decide what to do now. Mm -hmm. So then they time wander, like you say, in this arbitrary, capricious mental mindset uh, where meditation and focus and baseline for me is so important because I can instantly recognize not only the mindset not being at my neutral or central or highest self, but also the emotions that I have can set forth an entirely different mindset that could be uh, what I want to ask about paying attention to what I don't want, paying attention to uh, what's missing, paying attention to what other people want for me. And so I believe that attention actually can create not only this void, like you were suggesting, but also resistance uh, in itself Mm -hmm. when we're not paying attention to, I'd hate to say the right things, but the things that are most aligned with what we want would uh, be the best way that I could describe it. How does attention create resistance to what we want? It's really or does it? <laughs> I've been <Yeah>. wrong already. <laughs> yeah, I would say that by suppressing, denying, actively attempting to rid yourself of certain mental content, you're actually doing the opposite. Because the way that attention works, in order to suppress, in order to deny, you have to attend to it. So that's maybe it's not exactly your point, but I just want to make that one because I think it's related. Please. Um, like for example, you know, this is a very classic experiment in, in cognitive neuroscience, psychology, cognitive psychology, Easy the, for you the to white, <laughs> the white bear experiment. So we bring people into the lab and we say, okay, for the next several minutes, I want you to th- not think about a white bear. Now don't think about a white bear. Don't think about white bear. Okay. Ready, set. What are you thinking about? White bear, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So because it is supposed to be prominent in the content you're to not think about, It has this paradoxical effect of being more prominent. So in some sense, resistance is a very similar idea. By by orienting to certain mental content or life experiences in that way, we are shining the flashlight of attention on it. 
in a probably an unproductive manner. So then the question becomes, well, what can I do instead? Right? There are certain things I don't want to have happen or certain ways I don't want to be. And you know, I'll just give you an example like from my own life. I mean, I have um, a 19-year-old son who just went away to college again after being home for the pandemic. And I was really sad. You know, I was just sad. I wanted to, um, I, of course I want him to go away, but there's like a heart, like a heartfelt ache of your child going away and being away from you. And I was really like, this is not acceptable. Don't feel sad. Like there's no logical <laughs> reason you should feel sad. He's happy, he's away at a great school, et cetera. And then I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm doing exactly the thing that I'm saying not to do. <laughs> Don't sit there and yell at yourself for having an experience. So what I decided to do, even in the context of a, of a mindfulness practice, is I, I really cued in on that experience of sadness and I just bathed in it in some sense. I brought it to the front and in an, an accepting and acknowledging way, allowed it to be the center of my attention for a discrete period of time. And what I found that did is that now every time that it appeared, that thought appeared, it was like somebody sitting next to me that wasn't bothering me. Like, yeah, sadness is here. But it didn't capture my attention, and it didn't end up having to smush it down over and over again, which freed up a lot of bandwidth. And is that a sensory familiarization, a mental familiarization, or just some general context of emotional connectivity that, you know, it's creates not, an, a, a balance in well, your body? Well, no, I think it's a lot more, maybe even simpler than that. It's, it's actually taking the notion of a floodlight and practicing it. So it's this notion of accepting all that arises and really comes down to what mindfulness is. It's not only about paying attention to what's happening moment by moment in terms of my formal description of mindfulness, but doing so sort of non-judgmentally and non-reactively. So it was allowing in full presence everything that was arising and the sadness was here, but not privileging any particular information. So it didn't get more weight in my mind than other mental content. And so there was no manipulation of anything. It was just appeared. So, And is yeah. it true that you can't out logic your emotions the way you feel. So you can't just think about, don't be sad, don't be sad, don't be sad. Cause, or for example, I went to law school yeah. and I would say, you know, let it go. Don't worry. Let it go. Let it go. And it never let it go. And then I found that for me, taking action actually could change the way that I felt, but logic could not. Is that true or what piece or part may be true or why do I feel that way? So <laughs> I have to be very safe when I'm asking questions. Okay, I got an expert here. <laughs> so I would say you can use your logic to manipulate your emotion. We do that all the time, frankly, right? We can use something called reappraisal where you think about a different aspect of it or you think about it differently. So right? framing. So that would be a reframing kind of approach. But there is another way you can orient to the experience, which again comes from sort of an attentional or mindfulness-based perspective. And it's a practice called open monitoring. I don't know if you're familiar with that practice, probably you're doing it. So it's this notion, again, going back to kind of what I was saying before, it's, it's almost like getting in stealth mode with yourself. Like, okay, I'm gonna, for this period of time, I'm gonna do this practice me, the observer, is going to stay stationary and stable. I'm the thing that will not be changing. But mental content will come and go, right? So now it's the let it go is literally all you're practicing because you're noticing the arising of sensations, thoughts, feelings, whatever, emotions, memories, and then they're passing away. And, you know, people describe this uh, beautifully in many kind of poetic moments, like, oh, it's like clouds passing in the sky. In my book that, thank you for mentioning it, um, I think of it, I call it a river of thought. So you sort of imagine yourself sitting on the bank of a river on this stable rock, and then thoughts, emotions, whatever it is, occurs and moves away. We don't practice that. We don't really practice truly letting go. And the way the brain functions, for something to not be let go has to actively be refreshed. It's an active, energetically costly attentional process to, to actually put it back on what I formally called working memory, but it's our mental whiteboard. So our mental whiteboard only has a half-life of several seconds. Things aren't gonna stay there forever. The, the reason they feel like they're still there is because we keep refreshing them, and we refresh them by paying attention to them. So if we can pay attention in a way that doesn't refresh them, they will pass away. And Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And in, in your book, Peak Mind, you talk about you know finding your focus 
but there was one thing that just, there, there's certain things about a book or a title that just draw me to it. And it was, and people who know me will realize this, invest 12 minutes a day, or I believe in the conscious continuum. I preach the enjoyment of the consistent every day, persistent without quit yeah. pursuit of my potential, my peak mind, uh, which is completely aligned with what the book is that came out a, a few days ago. Um, why is it so important to invest 12 minutes a day to find our focus, to reach our potential? This comes out of about a decade and a half of research. Once we started uh, understanding that groups like soldiers, elite athletes, business leaders, medical professionals could benefit from a formalized mindfulness program, even under high stress circumstances like pre-deployment training, for example, very intense circumstances, then it became a matter of if you want this to be scaled up, it's got to be time efficient. And then my laboratory really got interested in this idea of a minimum effective dose, right? So what is, what's the least amount of time? And we basically set out on a course of research that took what was sort of the gold standard of, of practice, which is about an eight-week eight training, 24-plus hours, 45 minutes a day of practice. And then we kind of systematically, systematically reduced the time frame. And in that, we varied how much we asked people to practice. Initially, we asked, you know, 45 was sort of the norm. Nobody was doing 45. Right. We asked for 30. Really, nobody was doing 30. So then we looked at the data and we said, okay, forget what we asked them to do because they're not complying because um, busy people aren't going to be able to do that. And then we said, what is the, let's just look at the data and tell us what it, let's see what it tells us. And what it was telling us is when people did about 12 minutes or more a day, they benefited. But when they did less, they really weren't benefiting in a way that could be sort of, you might call tractable or you know neurally solid enough for us to see. And so then our subsequent studies only offered them 12 minutes a day. And this was a project actually we did with the University of Football, uh, University of <laughs> Miami's football team. University of Football is not a bad name. Not bad at all. Um, and we invited all the players in. And at, we had, you know, that, at that time the coach was very interested in being able to help players. And so, and he wanted everybody to get something, some kind of training. So we compared people getting about Seven days a week, we asked them to do 12 minutes of practice. Half the team got mindfulness. The other half of the team got relaxation and visualization training. So everybody got something. And the performance psychology field suggests visualization and relaxation are great. So let's try it out. And what we found is that people did not practice seven days a week. The sweet, sw sweet spot was about three to five days a week of 12 minutes. That helped us triangulate on a minimum effective dose. And so then, you know, then we can now prescribe that. And what we find is when we prescribe 12 minutes a day, five days or so a week, people do it. And when they do it, they benefit. If they want to go for it and practice more, it's really a dose response effect, just like physical activity. The more you do, the more you benefit. That is awesome. Last question is about something that I think is definitely interrelated to the attention um, and the mindfulness, which is resilience. And mm. I believe on the entrepreneurial side and the athletic side that people quit because of time, that, that when they have positive behaviors, they expect an instant result or a very fast result. And the exact opposite is true. When we don't do what we're supposed to do, when we have negative behavior, that we never expect the result yeah. or any accumulation or aggregation of the activity or, or the training or the, or the practice. Yeah. How is resilience interrelated with attention and mindfulness? I know you speak about it in the book, but how is it interrelated? It's really closely related because in my view, what is resilience? It's this capacity to maintain or regain things that are at risk in your life, whether it's your ability to focus, feel emotionally regulated, productive, perform well, feel connected, all those things. So it's like it was there and it's now not, and you gotta bounce back. So that's an active process. And, and what we actually study in my lab because we focus on attention is cognitive resilience because it ends up that under high stress circumstances, now that could be a product launch, that could be a high demand sales season for entrepreneurs, preseason training or the competition season for athletes. You can, you can think of any kind of high stress interval. It ends up that core attentional capacities decline. They just do. And in fact, the entire football team as a whole showed that decline, just going back to that example, everybody's attention declined. Their mood also got worse. But these people that were practicing, both relaxation and mindfulness, by the way, 
were able to protect against the decline in their well-being. Their mood was protected. And to me, that is an example of resilience. The interesting thing was that only the mindfulness group actually had their attention protected. So mm. in some sense, I see mindfulness as a very efficient twofer. <laughs> you get the emotional and, and psychological resilience benefits and the cognitive benefits. So doing, do, if you're going to do one thing, consider doing a mindfulness practice 12 minutes a day. Well, if you want to enjoy the consistent everyday, persistent without quit, that resilience pursuit of your potential, your peak mind, definitely find your focus. Invest 12 minutes a day with my good friend, Amishi Ja. She's an incredible scientist and an author that you cannot miss. Go check it out. It's peak mind. You can find it everywhere. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here.